What's happening, Party Animal Nation? It's me, hashtag RDM Russell Devin McLean, and I just want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you in part by Racket Sound and Lighting. For big production on a musician's budget, contact Bob Tolar at 225-773-4639. And also by Keller Williams Realty Premier Partner, Tanya Halford. Do you need assistance buying or selling a new home? Contact Tanya today for your free consultation at 225 225- 0-2-0-6-5-7. And now it's time for the show. So crank it up. Hey, folks, this is Richard Young with the Kentucky Headhunters, and you're listening to the Radio Random Network. Keep it on this dial. It's another day in paradise here at the Radio Random Studios here in the heart of Louisiana. I'm hashtag RDM Russell Devin McLean. It's Friday. It's Sounds of Louisiana here on the Radio Random Network. Thank you for hitting the download button on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or wherever you're listening to us from. I want to remind everyone that all the links talked about on today's show, as well as information on how you can listen to past episodes, support the show, or you can contact us here at Radio Random Network, can be found by visiting www.rrnonline.com. My guest today is from the Grammy Award-winning country Southern Rock Music Group, the Kentucky Headhunters, here to talk about a brand-new album and a couple of other things. Richard Young will be joining me. But before I get to today's interview, I want to send a couple of shout-outs, first and foremost, to Amanda French-Clark, and the hard-working folks at Webster PR for always taking care of us here at the Radio Random Network. And to my homies over at Riffs and Rigs Podcast for all the support. And, by the way, boys, congratulations on making the new and noteworthy on iTunes. I encourage everybody listening to check them out. Also, I want to send a big shout-out to J.R. Gwynn for leaving a five-star rating and review on iTunes. It's the best way to support the Radio Random Network. You can do the same by visiting rrnonline.com for all the details. Quick note, y'all, I will be with the Southern Shot Band, hanging out with Buddy, Kevin, and the boys on May 9th. Showtime, 9 o'clock. It's going to be at the Warsaw Marina. Y'all stop by and say hello. I'm sitting here talking with one of the founding members of the multi-platinum award-winning supergroup, the Kentucky Headhunters. I'm talking about the one and only Richard Young. Now, Richard, before we talk about the new album, Meet Me in Bluesland, featuring Johnny Johnson, for those that are listening and have been living under a rock and aren't familiar with the Kentucky Headhunters, tell us a little bit about how you guys got started. Well, Russell, we started the Headhunters. Uh, actually, before we were the headhunters, we were called Itchy Brother. And, uh, we started out in 1968. And, uh, went, uh, you know, so Fred and Nancy were just 11 years old. I think Greg and I were 13 or something like that. And so in a, within a couple of years, we'd gotten good enough to play, you know, the, the local rock bars and that sort of thing down near Bowling Green, Kentucky and Louisville. And, and our parents, of course, had to drive us to them, but we, Got to open for a lot of the great southern, uh, southern rock bands of the early seventies and that sort of thing. And we'd have to, we'd have to play and then stand outside the bar and peer in the windows, you know, Adam, but, uh, it was still a great experience. And, uh, but as long as our parents were there with us, we could be in there, but we couldn't after we stopped playing. But, uh, we started out right then. And, uh, of course, I played all through the seventies and early eighties as Itchy Brother and had some great close calls with, uh, uh, the Capricorn Records down in, uh, Georgia in the mid, mid, uh, 70s. And then, uh, uh, later on in the late 70s, we uh, worked with the Led Zeppelin's label, Swan Song. And of course, it was unfortunate that John Bond, the drummer, passed. So that opportunity, uh, eluded us once again, you know. And, uh, in 1986, Itchy Brother morphed into the Headhunters with the addition of, uh, Doug Phelps. And, uh, his brother, uh, joined, uh, oh, my six months later. And, uh, you know, we, we had a great, great time playing together and, uh, did, uh, a couple of really good albums picking on Nashville Electric Barnyard. And of course, um, uh, Doug's brother Ricky left in, in 92. And, uh, we were able to get a good friend of ours, Mark Orr, that sang an itchy brother to come in and sing. And then our cousin, Anthony Kenny came to place the, uh, Doug for a while because he split with his brother. <laughs> so anyway, it didn't take, it didn't take Doug long to figure out he'd messed up. So he came back and of course Anthony stayed and 
uh, market had about enough of it at that time. So uh, well, we were fortunate enough to do uh, one great uh, blues rock album, and then also the uh, did our first album that we did with the legendary uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Johnny Johnson in '93. Thanks to a couple of Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones who had brought Johnny out of obscurity and uh, and actually you know did a solo album on with Eric Clapton and then our big twos. I know Eric Clapton and Keith Richards was instrumental with reintroducing Johnny Johnson to the music world. But how did you guys come to meet him? And can you give us a little history on? Who exactly Johnny Johnson is? We met Johnny at the Grammys. We heard his first album. We're going up there. We had been, uh, we'd actually been nominated for the third or fourth time. But this was for uh, a single of the only daddy that walked the line from our second album. It was used uh, in, a, in the movie Dutch years ago. But anyway, we uh, we went to the Grammys. Went to the pre party the night before, and there sat Johnny Johnson. He was up for a Grammy for his album. And so we we just made best of friends that night. Of course, I had a lot of celebrities there, but we didn't care anything about talking to them. We wanted to talk to Johnny Johnson. Uh, back in 1955, Johnny had a, a a little group in St. Louis called the Sir John Trio. And one night, his sax player didn't show up on New Year's Eve in 55, I think. And uh, there was this little skinny kid been running around trying to play in bands named Chuck Berry. So he said, well, I'll call this kid and get him to fill in. And it started a relationship that night between those two guys, and they became, I guess, what you would actually call the first rock and roll pairing, where you have people like Robert Plant and Jimmy Page and Steven Tyler and Joe Perry, where it's a, a guitar uh, singer thing that really drives the band, I guess. And so that was probably the first time that ever happened, uh, uh, of course, the Everly Brothers, but but I mean, you know, as far as uh, as back that far back, uh, I guess they were the first rock and roll pair, and uh, all those great songs they created together, like Maybelline and oh, uh, you know, Sweet Little Sixteen. Johnny B. Good, of course, was actually uh, Chuck wrote the lyrics originally about Johnny, and uh, so so when. When they actually started, they did a movie. I don't, I don't know if you remember this movie. Uh, it was called Hail, Hail, Rock and Roll. Yes, I do. And it, it, that was a great film, a documentary film on Chuck Berry. And uh, Keith Richards was <laughs> from the Stones. Yeah, that's was when made he punched the music him. Director. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. That's when he punched Keith Richards. Didn't, didn't he, uh, he punch him in the eye for uh, setting it, trying to set his amplifier? <laughs> Yeah, did you see that? Yeah, well, you know, you don't, Chuck, you can't monkey with Chuck Sam, you right. know? That's a funny thing. Yeah, and that was true. I, I, Johnny, you know, uh, after we got to know Johnny well, I said, I said, Johnny, what, what happened? He said, oh, Chuck got all swelled up. You know, he does that occasionally. But anyway, uh, I know Chuck, I know Keith had quite a time getting it done. But uh, he he said, well, I'll be the music director if we can bring Johnny and Chuck back together, because they had not really played together since the late 60s. Uh, I mean, a, a whole lot. I'm sure that time, every once in a while, but as a band, they hadn't. And uh, so so Keith Richards was able to locate Johnny in St. Louis and put the two of them together for that film, and then that's where uh, Keith was doing solo records at that time for uh, Electric, Electric Records. And uh, he said, well, you know, I'd like to do a solo album on Johnny. And that's how he got to do his record. And then uh, after the uh, Grammy nomination that Johnny got for his record, there was talk of the, of the uh, second album. And we were actually asked to do it. And, of course, we, when they called us, we didn't say, well, I don't know. We said, when do we start? Because uh, we got to produce and write and record with uh, a real rock and roll legend. And, um, you know, he's called the, the greatest side man of all time uh, because he, without, I, I, I just dare, I, I doubt without Johnny, but we know he wouldn't, it would have been a different life for Chuck Berry, you know. And uh, Now, at what point did you guys decide to do an album together? And in 2003, we were recording the album Soul. And, uh, we, we had to cut the uh, Freddie King's old blues song, uh, Have You Ever Loved a Woman? And we wanted Johnny to play piano when we cut it. So we flew him into Kentucky 
And the night before, he had played with the Rolling Stones at the Reliant Theater in, uh, excuse me, not a theater, Reliant Stadium in uh, Houston, Texas. And I don't know, he, he was, he was, he was like so strong because think about it. He stayed out all night hanging out with Keith Richards and got on the airplane <laughs> and then flew to Kentucky. Yes, indeed. But as he was, as he was making his way to us, his wife called me and explained to me that Johnny was not really well and that we should keep him down there because he loved the head on us. That was just, you know, when he'd get to play with us and hang out and he'd go to my mom and dad's house and mom would fix some red eyed gravy and rum cake and all this food he liked that he wasn't supposed to eat really. <laughs> and, uh, so he'd stay with us and, and, uh, but uh, we, we kind of looked at each other cause we were in the middle of recording our own album. So we put that album on hold and took three days and wrote and recorded an album with Johnny when he got there. And that's our new project that's coming out. We've been sitting on this. It's been upstairs in my music room at my house since 2003 because, and we really didn't even listen to it. Right, right. Because we didn't have time. We needed to get back on our album. So we just took the multi-tracks. And, you know, Johnny Johnson was like, uh, I always use this term, he was like Frank Sinatra, you know, Frank Sinatra was singing one time, and, and uh, he never did two takes, but this young engineer said, uh, Mr. Sinatra, can we get one more pass at that? And he said, I don't do I do not do things twice. If you didn't get it, you didn't get it. So, yes, indeed. <laughs> that was, that was, and so Johnny was like that, too. You know, and a lot of very creative people, they get bored really. And so the moment, right at the moment, you've got to catch them right there, and so we had to be on our game and, and not have any rehearsal time or anything like that. You know, to do it originally, uh, you know, Johnny just came in and we started writing songs. So uh, I, I can remember uh, being in the singing booth and I had one verse for one song, for two songs. I just had a verse for each one of them I jotted down. And I wound up, I wound up during the solos of the piano and guitar, I would, I would literally write down another verse, which uh, that was pretty crazy, man, to be honest with you. <laughs> funny thing about it, Russell, when we got back, uh, when we got we got this stuff, and, and actually last fall in October, we had started writing a new head on our album. And for the people who don't know, we have an old farmhouse we've had that since the 60s. We call it the practice house. Uh, down on our farm that my grandmother gave us to rehearse in when we were kids. Right. And it's still there. And of course, my son's band, Blackstone Cherry, the big rock band, they use it too. <laughs> and they've been using it for 12, 13 years. But uh, they, we were in there writing songs, and Francis Johnson, Johnny's wife, who we love dearly, called and said, Richard, you know, I'm starting to get older, and I sure would love to. To, to be able to hear and enjoy all that great music you guys recorded with Johnny, because she didn't, she never heard any of it either. So we stopped, and I got the tapes baked, and and I went down to Nashville, got that done, and brought them back up to Kentucky into the, to the studio, and we put them up on the mixing console. And I was expecting Russell that we would probably have about three weeks' work, you know, fixing because when you cut an album that fast, normally there's a lot of things you want to redo and make better. And, you know, it must have been the hand of God on it or something because in the end, all we did after listening, we were just appalled when we listened to it. We were like, how did this happen this good? And there was all these great, uh, uh, great uh, songs and there was no uh, repair. There was no repair needed on them. Uh, we, I think Doug resang two of the songs he sang and maybe I fixed two lines on one of my songs and, Greg had left out a guitar solo on one of the songs, and he came in and played it. And we went to mix it during the holidays, and we're done. Right. And, uh, you know, we found out, of course, you know, you realize this album, it was very important not only to, um, we had to be very good stewards of this record because Johnny, there there was no more Johnny Johnson. There, there, there wasn't a compilation anywhere in the world of unreleased material on Johnny. So, we had to start then start searching for the proper record label. And thank the good Lord, we, we were able to get Mr. Bruce Eglar in Chicago, who has the, the premier blues label, Alligator Records. 
and they, he's had that label since he graduated from college in 1971, and I would suppose it's one of the only still standing indie labels in, in our uh, country today. And, uh, well, I was a little scared to send it to him because I didn't want him to say no, but our friend Bubba Sullivan down at uh, Helena, Arkansas, uh, who was great friends with LeVon Helm and all those guys, you know, they grew up together, uh, he, he, you know, he called him up and said, Bruce, it has hundred boys. It's got a Johnny Johnson album that they did with Johnny. So Bruce called me and asked for a copy. And in a few days, he called me back. And of course, I had my fingers and toes crossed. He said, well, we're, we're all really liking this record a whole lot, Richard. And said, uh, I think we want to do this. And so I was like, yay, you know, right, right. But, uh, most of Bruce's, most of Bruce's employees have been with him. Oh, for 25 to 30 years. So you can understand what kind of organization that really is and how close they all are. But it can't just be Bruce. Everybody at the label's got to like it if they're going to work it. And, they, and so we passed the test and, and the record will be coming out. It'll be in stores and uh, online uh, June 2nd. That's right. And actually, yeah, if people would like to, I think, you, I think that Bruce has it, uh, Alligator has it where you can actually maybe pre-ordered at this point. You can. It could be pre-ordered on iTunes. That way, you know, you, you go and it's a digital thing. You, you go order it on uh, iTunes now and on June 2nd. Without you touching a button, it drops straight to your uh, smart device or computer or what have you, and you got the album right there. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. We're really excited about it, man. I, I noticed that, that this record is doing something that, that I haven't seen one of our albums do in a long time. It's crossing genres with people that like it. Everybody from, from young teenagers to, to people our age are digging it. So it's, uh, you can't always, you know, it's like, uh, like I always use this term. I heard John Lennon say it one time in an interview from the Beatles. He said, somebody said, well, boy, be not, why don't you write a song like that? And he said, well, every song right, he right. loves you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and of course, you know, when, when you're recording songs, uh, the, where you're at with your band and with your family and, and your surroundings that has a huge effect on any record you make. And so, you know, sometimes you make an album and, and it'll sell a million and then, you know, you'll do one and it just, it seems to fly over the top of people's head. They never saw it. But Greg, Greg I like it. Greg. <laughs> He said, we've got some albums that's gone double platinum. We've got some that's gone platinum. We've got some gone gold. And we've got <laughs> yes, some that's indeed. gone cardboard. But they're all yes, good. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've always been blessed that we had a huge fan base, and they've always supported us. And, uh, you know, we're all uh, in our early 60s, you know, 60 years old, 58, 59 now. So, We've been playing together for 46 years, uh, most of us, and Doug Phelps has been with us for 30. So I figure that we've been pretty blessed and lived uh, pretty much by being able to go out on the road and rock and roll and then come back home and, and uh, you know, get on our tractors and play with our cows and that sort of stuff. It's a pretty charmed life. And it kind of, I guess it kind of, it keeps a, a, a landing strip and keeps you really even keel. Uh, you know, where you don't go astray the yes, wrong indeed. way or something. Because I, I, I do a lot of thinking on the <laughs> down there. So, so in downtime, whenever you guys ain't touring, that's what you guys are doing. You're, you're home and you're tending to the uh, the farmland. Well, yeah, Greg actually has a little blues show he does on Monday night. Really? In Bowling, Kentucky. And, uh, of course, Greg can be seen jamming at any any <laughs> tug of hole. <laughs> Uh, in Kentucky any night. When we get home off the road, we're worn out after like two weeks, and Greg will go take a shower and drive to Louisville and jam with somebody. He just loves it. And uh, Fred and I, of course, we get back to farming, and uh, I'm getting ready to – I'm trying to put my garden out a little later this year because every year I put my garden out early, and all my beans and my tomatoes and everything come in in July and August when I'm uh, – the hottest month. I don't think we're home but five days in August, and uh, all my crops are ruined. So I'm trying to, I'm going to test it to see if I can have everything coming in at the end, right at September, where things start to lighten up. At least I have a couple yes, days indeed. home then. 
And then, uh, yeah. Doug, he's a full time, uh, Mr. Mom these days. He's got three grandchildren. So as soon as we get home, he starts babysitting. <laughs> and the poor boy, that, he doesn't know that time. He, uh, Doug, Doug lives about 45 miles south of us down in Tennessee. We're in Kentucky, of course. And Doug will call me every day or two and he said, Man, we need to get together for anything. He's just looking for <laughs> yeah, you want to practice. <laughs> so, yeah, he wants to leave and come up here so the practice or something so he can say, hey, mm-hmm. I can't babysit. No, I sure he loves it, but, you know, it's kind of like Grafto Mark, you know, the cigars. you got to stop killing Yeah, we talked about the album and them. everything, and we talked a little bit about what you're doing in, in, the, in the home life. Nowadays, you, you had mentioned earlier about your son being uh, the drummer for Blackstone Cherry, which is, uh, you know, one of the probably the, the hottest thing going, especially here in the South. Yeah, in Europe, Europe too, Russell. Russell, they're huge over there. You know, they came to me, Russell, about, I think it was 2001, and uh, little Chris Robinson, the singer, and John Fred, of course, we used to take them to kindergarten. <laughs> right, They've been right. together since kindergarten. And then, John LaHan moved up like in the sixth grade from from Jacksonville, Florida. And then uh, they met the little Wells boy sometime around 2000, Ben. And they came to me and they said, uh, Dad, we, we want to move into practice house and, and start us our own band. And I was like, oh, no, they'll burn it down. Because <laughs> it's kind of a safe right, place right. to us, you know. And, and so I, I told my wife and she said, now, this is just be a passion thing. They're going to go through this stage where they want to have a little band. And I already knew when she said that. I said, you're, you're lying to yourself. You know what's going to happen here. It's in his blood. He's been around it ever since he's born. So anyway, they moved into practice house, and that's where my office is. I spend a lot of time in warm weather down there. And man, they came in the first night, and they started literally playing original songs. And it, they were good. And they started rehearsing and rehearsing. They would practice six days a week. And, uh, you know, they were, they had the, the best the drive of any band I've ever seen in my life. And so after a couple of months, I mean, they kept getting better and better. And I said, okay, okay, I'll help you. But don't bug me. Just listen to me and we'll see what we can get done with this. So anyway, we started to work writing and putting songs together and, and uh, I took them in the studio and cut a little demo on them and was able to land them a record deal with Roadrunner Records up in New York. And uh, so they, they, uh, they, the label allowed me to do the first real album, and we did it here where we record our albums at Barrack Recording. And we put that darn thing out. Of course, they had a top ten single in America, and then we sent them to Europe. There was a little band, too, that just yes. came out called Hinder. And they had a big hit. Yeah, they had a big hit here in America, and uh, we're doing well. So we sent both bands over to uh, Europe, and they shared equipment and did like fifteen clubs. And uh, Hinder, although they were huge in America, they they didn't catch on with the roots audience of, of Europe, like Blackstone Cherry. Actually, Blackstone Cherry just caught on like the gasoline on the floor over there. So uh, I'm proud to say that they went back and. Uh, played 15 clubs with themselves and sold them out for a live nation. And then the next gig they played, was, which broke the, the strain, is Aerosmith hadn't been on for eight years, and they took Blackstone Cherry with them to open. And the next day, the London Times blew up Blackstone Cherry then all over the U.K. And the rest is history. You know, uh, last fall, they sold out uh, five arenas in the U.K. alone, and one of them was Wembley Arena, so... We're really proud of them. And, uh, matter of fact, they just left out the 29th of April. They're doing 30 days in the States. And, uh, but them little boogers are starting to get some of my gigs. I got to watch them because, uh, I was, I was, look, I was, I was looking, uh, on their schedule and to show you, I guess what I really wanted to happen is start to happen. There's kind of a cross genre thing right, going right. on too there. Uh, and uh, there's a there's a big festival we play the Country Dolphin Fest up in Canada in Dolphin Manitoba, and uh, I thought, wow, I haven't heard from the guys at Dolphin Manitoba for a couple of years. I wonder why we hadn't played. So I go to their website and look at their schedule, and there it is, Blackstone <laughs> Cherry playing. So I got 
I may have, I may have worked myself <laughs> out of a job. Oh, yes, I'm just indeed. kidding. That's great. And, uh, and then, and then, and then also, um, you know, uh, Billy Bob's, they're playing Billy Bob's with rival sons this year. That's going to be a good one for them, but in America, but, uh, they go back over, uh, in June to, uh, uh, oh, they go to Finland and, uh, the UK, Germany and Holland and all those countries to play the big festivals. And, uh, then they'll have a new album out first of the year. They're actually, they've already written some of the album and they'll come back and finish that when they get back off this tour and go in the studio and cut it and, and fly at it again. But I'm, we're awfully proud of them. They've done awfully well and, They've done, uh, I think they've done really well in America, you know, uh, um, with the, the market. It's, uh, you know, Russell, it, uh, a lot of people, folks, um, sometimes they don't get the band because they have a Southern rock vibe to them. Um, and, you know, with the, um, uh, Southern rock vocals, is, believe me, I know how hard that can be sometimes getting played in some of the major Western meccas and that sort of thing, but, uh, once you see the band right, live, right. you get it, you know. Well, before before I let you go and get back to your day, just a couple more things. First and foremost, I mean, you you guys with the Kentucky Headhunters and you yourself, I mean, you know music in and out. You know songwriting in and, in and out. Can you give a little advice to anybody out there, any, any musicians or songwriters that may want to follow in your footsteps? Well, I think the best thing to do is, is – is uh, everybody kind of gets the notion that maybe you have to move to a music mecca to really do something in the music. And we never did that. Even though now we have an advantage, we're only an hour and a half from Nashville, north of Nashville, uh, which was where we wound up making all of our big hit records. But, you know, always, always keep a landing strip. Stay close to home and your family and, uh, remember that that's really the nucleus of, of what life is about and that the, the music business is, can be quite fleeting and uh, it comes and goes in, in, uh, waves, so to speak. You know, uh, it's kind of like farming, uh, Russell, you know, one time you'll have a bumper crop, but if you do, you can just watch out and you're going to have a couple of lean year crop years. And the music business is like that. It, uh, every day can't be cotton candy. You're going to have records that are going to do well and you have records. If, if you, if right. you have your craft right and you find something that then are able to hit, hit home with people's hearts and minds, then even with that, you have days that are golden. And as I said, you have days that are cardboard and you just, it's kind of like the cattle business, man. You can't get in and out of it. You just got to get in it and take the, the butt kickings with the, with the pats on the right. back, you know. All right. I think that's probably the best thing I can say is stay close to family and stay close to friends and don't ever forget where you came from because when you do, people will remind that you. That was great, man. <laughs> it was an honor talking to you, Mr. Richard. Same here, Russell, and, and it's good It's good to talk to somebody that's very versed in music. You know, a, a lot of the younger DJs today, they, they only know what happened yesterday, and and uh, so I, you have to do a lot of explaining, but you knew what I was talking about, and that sure is a good feeling. Well, yeah, hard I to appreciate find it. Man, I've been following y'all since, uh, I tell you, when I got hooked is, uh, I don't remember if it was a uh, show for the NFL or something. Anyway, come on. I want to say the old TNN network, and I was I was fairly young, probably about four or five years old. But you guys was with Hank Williams Jr. and uh, <laughs> I, I've been hooked ever since. Been listening ever since. So I've been following you guys. Oh, I know what that was, Russell. Russell, that was that was us and Hank at that was Stadium it. in St. Louis. You right? Yeah, yeah. That's a that was a big show. Uh, I tell you, if you want to have, you know, I like going back and listening to the old videos, and also uh, I like looking at the old farm I Yes, indeed. The spirit right, in the right. sky. Man, what a great interview. It was great talking to Mr. Richard about the new album and everything that they got going on. For more information, like I said, you can visit KentuckyHeadHunters.com or you can just go to RNOnline.com and visit the show notes. While you're there, don't forget to visit our sponsors. 
Every time you shop with our sponsors, such as Amazon or audibletrial.com forward slash in the now, they kick a little bit of money back to us to keep the lights on and the show free for all of our listeners at no extra cost to you. Be sure and do that. Don't forget to rate and review on iTunes. And don't forget, May 22nd, I'm going to be joined by the one and only Michael Grimm. I want to thank you again for downloading. And don't forget to follow us if you're on Sprinker. We're all over the place. We're also on TuneIn, Player FM, Stitcher Radio, again on iTunes. You can find all the information one more time at rrnonline.com. Thank you so much. I'm hashtag RDM. Russell Devin McLean will be back next Tuesday with another great interview from another great musician. Y'all take care. Be safe. Enjoy your weekend. Happy Mother's Day. We'll talk to you Tuesday.